Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Sacred Grace Inglewood. My name is Nathan. I get to be the parish pastor around here. It's great to be with you tonight. Um, I've got a lot of family in the room. Thank you all for being here from long and far away. Um, and they are all familiar with this story. Many of you are not familiar with this story. Um, my senior year of college, I went to Valdosta State University in South Georgia. Go Blazers. Uh, uh, medium-sized college in the middle of nowhere. And by my senior year, I needed to change. I just like something needed to be different. Something needed to shift. And um, because a friend of mine had done this in Nebraska, I decided that I was going to live in a tent for the entirety of my senior year. Okay. So for the whole school year, I was going to live outside. That was my plan. I was like, that seems to be the best way to make a change that would be meaningful and impactful in my life. And uh, so I got rid of most of what I owned. I bought a big tent. I had an air mattress. I had like a couple tubs of clothes. I had a couple tubs of food. I had like a stove. And that was pretty much it. I was like, this is going to be simple. This is going to be minimal. This is going to be really, really great. And for the first month, it was actually just terrible because I almost had a heat stroke every single day because in August in South Georgia, it's just hot. It's like 90 degrees at nighttime. Like it doesn't matter if the sun's gone. It's just so, so hot. Then after that, things were great. And for a couple months, it was really great. It was simple. It was easy. It was uh, fun. It was refreshing. And then after a couple of months of that, all of the little small inconveniences and complexities of living outside, as you might be able to imagine, compounded on each other, and all of a sudden, my really simple life became a very complex life. There was a lot of things that just happened all at once, it seemed, that made things really difficult. Uh, for, I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, I had found this guy in our church who had some property in the middle of town where I could pitch this tent and I could live on his property. I don't know why he didn't say no when I asked him, but he didn't. So um, I, the problem was I had to walk across this horse pasture every single day to get to and from my car or my bike or whatever I was parking there to get to my tent. And um, because there's a lot of poop and mud in a horse pasture, I didn't like walking through that with my shoes. So I left like a pair of rain boots by this fence post and I, I would put them on and walk, you know, for, to and from my tent. This is the sort of thing that I was trying to sort out my senior year of college. Anyway, um, one day I showed up and I put my feet, I, had, I was wearing sandals, so bare feet into my rain boots. And I would say somewhere between 12 and 15 slugs had found their way into... I almost amputated my foot. It was by far the grossest thing that I've ever experienced in my life, putting my bare foot on top of a whole bunch of slugs and just smashing them into this boot. I burned those boots, so it doesn't matter, but um, that was a gross experience. Um, one night, I remember I was laying in bed, and I heard this r- loud rustling sound. It sounded louder than the foxes and raccoons that were normally out there, so I kind of unzipped the tent, and I shined my headlamp over towards the river where the sound was coming from, and there was an enormous alligator, like 10 feet from my tent, uh, like made eye contact with the thing. And for the rest of the night, it was just moving around right by my tent. No idea what was going to happen to me. Uh, I was very worried and concerned by that. Didn't sleep a lot. Woke up one morning covered in fire ants. They had been feasting on me for who knows how long. Um, uh, there was a flood at one time. I had to move my tent because I was in like knee deep water. Um, I, one morning I woke up to gunshots. Sometimes in this neighborhood, I wake up to gunshots, but it's because people are shooting at each other, not because this guy who owned this property decided to kill an animal. Uh, near my tent. Did not tell me about that ahead of time. Didn't get a lot of sleep during this time, is kind of my point. All of a sudden, all the things that I thought were going to be simple and easier and more convenient are actually more com- complex, more complicated, more difficult, um, and more hard to ma- like more difficult to manage. And I think as part of the reason is because we think that the simple life or the more minimal life, the life where we have less stuff, is going to be the thing that delivers simplicity to us. But in reality, the things that we choose sometimes for that are actually just make things less convenient, and sometimes less convenience may, means uh, complexity. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about how simplicity is a prerequisite for healthy generosity. Last week, we talked a little bit about how gratitude is a prerequisite for healthy generosity, and um, tonight we're going to talk about how simplicity, a real simplicity, not a simplicity that's like masquerading, or a complexity that's masquerading as simplicity, but a real simplicity um, can actually lead to generosity. And tonight, in order to do that, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 30, uh, verses 7 through 9, um, just a few verses. It goes like this. Two things that I ask of you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I, have, uh, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
This proverb was written by a guy named Agur. Um, I couldn't really find much on this person. Everything that everybody writes about this guy is derived from this particular proverb, so they're basically just telling you things that you already know about this person. A lot of conjecture about his personality based on the proverb. Um, there's not a lot that we know about the author, author. But we do know that this, as a proverb, is actually a very useful text. It, proverbs are meant to be used for us when we're looking for something that briefly and portably describes uh, a theme or an idea. Okay, that's what the proverbs are meant to do. So Unlike the self-contained poetry of each psalm, Proverbs are a compilation of pithy, memorable sayings about living wisely. So the Proverbs are, uh, one chapter in Proverbs may have 10 different ideas, but the idea is that the, the, uh, each idea that is spoken about is pithy, memorable, and portable. And, and this particular one in chapter 30 is no different than that. Our friend Agur is describing something that I would refer to as simplicity, um, he describes provision without access, or excess, sorry. He describes provision without excess. And we refer to um, this, this idea of daily bread on a regular basis here when we do the prayers of the people, right? We end with the Lord's Prayer and we talk about daily bread. This reference, both in the Proverbs and in that prayer that Jesus gave us, uh, is a reference to a story um, when God's people were exiled, um, or they, were, they, were, uh, they, they experienced freedom from the slavery that they were experiencing in Exodus. So they leave Exodus, <laughs> God, they leave Egypt, they experience the Exodus from Egypt, and they're out in the wilderness, and they have nothing. And at first, it's refreshing. At first, it's simple. At first, it's great, because they're free. And before long, they realize they don't actually have anything. They don't have the things that they need. They don't have the food that they need, and they start to dream about going back, even into slavery, just to have what they need, just to survive. So they pray to God, and God says, yeah, I'll provide for you this thing called manna, like literally daily bread. Bread would fall to the ground. They'd wake up every morning. They would collect this bread, but they were only allowed to collect the amount that they needed, no excess at all. If they collected any excess, it would grow moldy and stale, and it would be unusable for them. The whole point of that was that God was keeping them in some sort of healthy dependence on him, not the codependency of a slave to a master, but the healthy dependency of a child to a father is what they would experience on this daily basis. That is where the term daily bread comes from. Daily bread is simple, day-to-day, childlike dependence on God's providence. Simple, day-to-day, childlike dependence on God's providence. That's what um, the author of Proverbs 30, Agur, is talking about. This is the simplicity um, that he proposes and the simplicity that I think is real and I think that leads to, at some point, some level of generosity. Now, there's a growing trend of minimalism that you hear people talking about. There are documentaries, there are books, there are magazine articles, there are blogs about this, okay? And I think it's all, or a lot of it can be really, really great. The problem is, is if you do just a quick search on minimalism or a quick search on, on simplicity, you're going to find a whole bunch of information um, that gives you like, here are five quick tips for simplicity. Here are seven quick tips for minimalism. Here's uh, this idea or that idea. And unfortunately, a lot of them are the same sort of complexity that we talked about before, masquerading as simplicity. They're not the simple life that you think they're going to be. They are simple on the front end, but they don't actually give us the freedom um, that we experience from real simplicity, the kind of simplicity that Agar describes here, which is the kind where we are on a daily basis dependent on God for no more and no less than what we need, neither poverty nor riches. Because in poverty, we would be, um, we would be resentful and we would, we would be angry at God. Um, and if we had excess or in riches or in wealth, we may, not decide, we may decide that we don't need God very much. We may move away from him depending on the circumstances. Simplicity is daily bread. Simple day-to-day childlike dependence on God's providence. So why does this matter to generosity? Why does the simple life or some sort of day-to-day dependence on God's um, uh, providence or God's provision, uh, why does that matter to generosity? I I genuinely think that gratitude is a prerequisite, like we talked about last week, and I also think uh, that this idea of simplicity is a prerequisite because when our lives are complicated, when they are full and we are at our capacity, we do not have the capacity or capability to participate in real and healthy generosity at all, okay? Um, I'm gonna illustrate this really quickly. Um, I meant to move this in the, the break, but I forgot to do that. I need three volunteers. Quick, come on, don't think, just do. Yeah, Stephen, good. Who else? Two more, there we go. Here we go. Three. Awesome. Okay. So there's a task uh, that you each have to complete. Okay. So find, find your spot. All right. I'm going to move this out of the way and you have to complete your task as fast as you possibly can. 
okay? We're all going to watch you. There's a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, please don't blow it, okay? Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Complete your task. <laughs> Kevin, come on, man. Do you guys want to help Kevin? This is pretty hilarious. I yeah. <laughs> okay, you're just going to watch him suffer? Okay, okay, you made my point. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay, great job, volunteers. Okay, here uh, we have a puzzle that makes noises, which is very cute, okay? Very simple farm animals, okay? This one's a little bit more complex. This is a barn, uh, a a landscape, if you will, okay? A little bit more complex. This is a 500-piece puzzle uh, of a pile of marbles. This was Kevin's task. These ones... Uh, well, they were already completed because I did this part wrong, but they would have taken them a matter of seconds to complete because they are for children. This, on the other hand, took Julie and I a really long time to complete when we did it. I can't remember, um, uh, but, but it's not an easy one. This one's extremely complicated. These ones are extremely simple. When our life is an extremely complicated um, set of rules and uh, do's and don'ts and things that need to get done. Our life is full to the brim and we are at our capacity. And I'm going to say something that I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody else say. It's not like a genius idea. I just don't know that we're really willing to go here when it comes to generosity. I think that all generosity is complicated. Generosity is complicated. To choose to be generous is to choose complication. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's hard to step into somebody else's circumstances and to be generous towards them. There's easy versions of generosity, absolutely. But I would say that the healthiest generosity, generosity that has longevity, requires some sort of chosen complication. I'll give you an example. There's this uh, network around our city called the Severe Weather Shelter Network. Some of you are familiar with it. We've talked about it a little bit before here. Um, What they do, and and they'll they'll probably um, go into effect tomorrow, but uh, if, if the weather is 32 or below and, and wet or 20 below and dry, uh, the network goes into activation and lots of churches around town open up their doors for our homeless neighbors to sleep inside. The Severe Weather Shelter Network is literally saving people's lives. We don't have enough emergency shelters throughout the city of Denver, and cities like Inglewood don't have any emergency shelters. This is literally the only way for our homeless neighbors to sleep inside on a night that would otherwise kill them. They show up at a a warming site um, where some volunteers get them some coffee, get them signed up. They go in a bus to a church. They sleep on the floor. They're out of there by 7 a.m. They experience a meal with these volunteers, and there are people who literally stay up all night long um, to make sure that everybody's safe and has what they need. The amount of coordination that it takes to do this around the metro area is insane. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. This woman named Lynn Ann runs it, um, and she's a fireball, and she is an amazing person, and uh, I think she has maybe one of the most difficult jobs I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, it's an amazing amount of coordination and complication to make this work. This is maybe the most significant form of generosity that I've ever seen anybody participate in, saving people's lives who otherwise would not be able to survive the night, and it is super complicated. And, and maybe there's ways to make it a little bit more simple, but in reality, it's complicated. You can talk to anybody who's on our team that's planning the Inglewood Christmas store. It is complicated. There are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of people and a lot of gifts and a lot of people to uh, kind of get on the same page and on board. A lot of volunteers. We have over 100 families signed up for this store, shopping for um, Uh, 325 kids, which means we need over 650 gifts. And that's just to take care of two schools. There's more than two schools in the city of Inglewood. We'd like to do this for more people. But to say something like, we don't want any of the families at Bishop and at Maddox have to choose between rent and Christmas is a very complicated statement. It's memorable. It's pithy. It's easy. It's portable. It's something that you can take with you and think about. But to, to actually achieve that is tremendously complicated. And if your life is like this, If your life is Kevin trying to put (laughs) these little pieces that look like marbles together, you will not have the capacity, you will not have the ability to participate in real generosity, which requires complication. Real generosity always does. But when when at least some domains of our life, maybe not our entire life, but some domains of our life take on a level of simplicity, 
Like real simplicity, not this pretend simplicity that only lasts for a little while, but real simplicity, daily bread, a daily childlike dependence on God for provision. That simplicity allows for us to experience the complexity of generosity because real generosity almost always requires complexity. It's not easy. It's not simple and it's not straightforward. I'd love to say, hey, let's all just be more generous. We say this in our, in our generosity prayer every week. We want to increase in generosity. That's an important value to us. I would love to just snap my fingers and say, let's all be more generous. But what I really want for you, what I really want for me, what I really want for our church is to experience generosity with longevity, a real healthy uh, generosity that continues to make an actual difference in the lives of the people around us. And the only way to achieve that is to experience some level of simplicity in our life, which then allows us to take on and to choose the complexity of generosity. There's no such thing as a, uh, a meaningful generosity that doesn't require some level of complexity. So my hope for you is that you would lean into that daily, simple, childlike dependence on God for your daily bread, uh, literally and figuratively, that you would have the, thing that you need, the things that you need in the rest of your life so that you can choose the complexity of generosity. Um, a life of simplicity does not negate complexity. Rather, choosing simplicity where you can allows you to choose the complexity of generosity, and that's my hope for you. Um, we're going to end the, the sermon tonight uh, by praying our generosity prayer. Uh, so if you would stand with me, we're going to pray this prayer together. It'll be on the screen. All that we have, we have received from God. We bring nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. We choose to follow the way of Jesus and increase in generosity until it can be said, there is no one in need among us. We choose to be faithful stewards of all our resources, relationships, time, possessions, and money. We choose to be generous because our Father is generous. And as his daughters and sons, we want to show the world what he is like. Amen.